Good morning to you, Michael. You know, Jill and Derek's wedding and their pregnancies were ratings bonanzas, fueling her family's reality show, Juggernaut. The Duggar brand was all about loving parents and a blissful gaggle of kids. But Jill says for her, off camera, it was far more tense and far more painful. Jill and Jessa Duggar are two of the 19 kids belonging to Jim Bob and Michelle Duggar. Their reality TV show on TLC has been a hit for nine seasons. And tonight, they reveal themselves as victims of their brother Josh's inappropriate touching. I mentioned Jill, your sister. Uh, she and her husband Derek released their memoir yeah. about the family called Counting the Cost. In it, she opens up about everything from the toll that the TV show took on her marriage to her difficult relationship with your father, her father, Jim Bob. Jill alleged that Jim Bob was, quote, verbally abusive at times, and she was quoted describing the relationship as not good. It strikes me, and I think a lot of people, she wrote in one of the passages, you want to know why I'm crying? My voice was cracked, my eyes burning. It's that you think I'm some kind of horrible person just because I wear pants and I have a nose ring. You treat me like I'm a prodigal who's turned her back on you. You treat me worse than my brother. One of the main themes of the book is this toxic patriarchy, this idea that parents maintain control of their children into adulthood. If somebody's going to tell your story, you want to at least have want control to be over it, it and be the one to tell it and have your own input instead of people just taking things and running with it and making it whatever they want to. I grew up on TV and was pretty young whenever it started and there weren't a whole lot of safeguards in place for kids in television. Um, so whether it be like working a lot of hours and um, that kind of taking over your education or whatever it might be, like there weren't a whole lot of safeguards in place for us. Um, and I imagine not for other kids too, probably. If I had been given the option, I would not have wanted my birth film. I definitely do worry about um, my other family members and other people who are following the IBLP teachings um, and their cult-like practices. She has piercings. She's going to, well, she said that Jim Bob called it a two-kid church. Uh, it looks like it might be some sort of like non-denominational mega church maybe. And she's using birth control and she still believes in God. That's deconstruction. That's what it looks like. It does not always have to end in atheism. A few months back, I made a video reviewing the new Amazon Prime docu-series Shiny Happy People, which details how a cult was behind the former hit TLC show 19 Kids and Counting. Just last week, Jill Duggar, one of the former child stars of the show who has now left the reality TV world and her former cult behind for good, just released a book about the trauma going on behind the scenes during that show, the troubles of deconstructing from a cult when your parents are still involved, and the overall abuse that minors face from being placed in the spotlight as reality TV stars without their consent. Today, we're going to be reviewing Jill Duggar's new memoir called Counting the Cost, which not only exposes the dark truth behind 19 Kids and Counting, but also sheds light on the harms that the reality TV industry is imposing on kids. We're also going to talk about some of the responses that Jill has been receiving to this book, some of the public backlash from her family and her former fans, the people who think she should have been grateful to have involuntarily grown up in the spotlight. So let's get into all of that. Get you some nuts. Yeah, you effin'. Up yours, woke moralist. We'll see who cancels who. What's up, my fellow small business supporters? I'm Savvy. Welcome back to Savvy Writes Books, a channel where we talk about books and business. And today I've got another book review for you guys. But once again, please excuse the mess in my office and any barking that you might hear because life with two dogs has been a little crazy, but in the best possible way. Anyway, if you're new here, please don't forget to subscribe because every week I put out new videos about these types of topics. Today's video does not have a sponsor, but it was brought to you by my Patreon supporters. Thank you so much to everyone who supports this channel on 
on Patreon. Patreon supporters' names are up on the screen. Also, in the description below, you could find links to people who support my Patreon for $5 a month and up, so go ahead and give them some support as well. Also, don't forget that the September merch drop for my merch company, Hipster Unicorn Fashion, has now released, and it includes these cute beanies like the ones I'm wearing right here. I am enjoying wearing uh, these new beanies all the time because it's getting into that fun fall weather, and I'm working on some really cool designs for the November and December drop, so stay tuned for that, but keep in mind the September fall collection is available now, including these cute beanies like the one I'm wearing on my head. Yes, sir! With all of that in mind, let's get into today's video. You don't need to have already watched my video on shiny happy people to watch this video. I do recommend watching that one as well, because in that video we talked a lot about the history of the cult involved in all of this. That cult is called the Institute in Basic Life Principles, often shortened to the IBLP, and we also talk a lot about the Duggar family themselves in that video. But I don't want you to have to like pause this video and go back to watch that other one, so I'm gonna give some brief background on everyone involved real quick. Who is Jill Duggar? Now 32 years old, Jill Duggar is the fourth oldest sibling in the Duggar family, which has a total of 19 kids. She's the daughter of Jim Bob Duggar, former candidate for Arkansas Senate. He lost. Candidate, not, not actual, not actual winner. And in addition to that, Jim Bob's just kind of an overall hyper-conservative fundamentalist Christian. Jill has three older siblings and 15 younger siblings, and ever since she was a teenager, Jill spent her entire life as one of the stars of TLC's hit show, 19 Kids and Counting. Jill was often a fan favorite of the show, being a sweet girl who didn't like to make waves. Her wedding episode, in which she married Derek Dillard, brought in millions of viewers who cheered and rejoiced with the announcement of her first child. However, in 2015, Jill's story also became one of the saddest on the show when In Touch magazine leaked an investigation report from years ago, revealing that Jill's older brother Josh, the oldest member of the Duggar clan, had done physical, non-consensual things to Jill back when she was 12. 12 years old. With Josh Duggar's predator side revealed, the show found itself in a lot of conflict, as did Jill, who never wanted this story released to the public. Just a few years ago, Jill decided to leave the world of reality TV behind for good. She now lives with her husband, Derek Dillard, and their three young children, and she does occasional interviews and documentary appearances to speak out against the IBLP and her childhood trauma. And Josh got caught seeking, downloading, and possessing inappropriate material of explicit child abuse, if you get what I'm saying, and he's currently serving 12 years in prison. What is the IBLP? The Institute in Basic Life Principles, or IBLP, is a religious cult headquartered in Hinsdale, Illinois. It was founded in 1961 by Bill Gothard, an absolutely unhinged man who believes he has a direct connection to God that most of us mere mortals lack. The organization is tied in heavily with Christianity, but a very extreme version of Christianity. Their beliefs include the idea that public schools are trying to indoctrinate kids and brainwash them against God, so everyone needs to homeschool their kids using only IBLP-created materials. However, one of their biggest core beliefs is the umbrella of authority, which states that we all exist in a hierarchy and we must be completely obedient to the ones above us in that hierarchy. Children are at the very bottom of the hierarchy with parents above them, local pastors above the parents, Bill Gothard himself above the pastors, and God above everyone else. But of course, God only talks to Bill Gothard directly, so it's not a cult, guys. What are the rules? What's unique about the IBLP's understanding of hierarchy is that it never changes, meaning that even when you become an adult, you are still subservient to your parents who are above you for the rest of your life. Your parents are always above you in the hierarchy, and when you have children of your own, those children are underneath you, but your parents are still above you. Offspring are meant to obey their parents not just until adulthood and not just until marriage, but for the entirety of their lives. The IBLP is also heavily intertwined with the Quiverful movement, which is a Christian movement that commands that everyone have as many children as they possibly can. No birth control, I mean abstinence until you're married, no sex until marriage, and then constant sex once you're married, and no birth control of any kind because you should be having as many kids as you possibly can. Imagine how many people out there right now are fucking men. The more kids you have, the more little soldiers you can train to grow up and spread the gospel. It's not a cult, though. Anyway, recently Bill Gothard had to step down as leader of the IBLP after more than half a century of leadership when he was accused by multiple women of physical and non-consensual misconduct. Ironically enough, even though Bill Gothard promoted the necessity of everyone birthing as many children as possible, he himself never actually got married or had any children, but the rules weren't supposed to apply to him. He's the leader. What are the rules? 
Interestingly enough, in Jill Duggar's new book, Bill Gothard's scandal is one of the main things she cites as the beginning of her deconstruction from the IBLP. Especially after the abuse that she herself faced, she couldn't continue to trust and support an organization led by someone who had been getting away with doing that very same thing behind closed doors. So now, let's head into a full discussion of Counting the Cost, the new book written by Jill Duggar, all about her process of leaving reality TV, the IBLP, and even pieces of her family behind. What does the book reveal? Now, I know you guys like to see me analyzing the writing of the books themselves, breaking down the language used, the sentence structure, the metaphors, the verb choices, the writing style, etc. <coughs> Nerd alert! <coughs> Nerd alert! So I hope today's video doesn't disappoint you because I don't have a ton of that to talk about in today's video. The reason being, while Jill did seem to write a lot of this book herself, she also did write it with the help of a professional writer named Craig Borlase. Now, I think this is great. When I reviewed Prince Harry's book earlier this year, I mentioned how I liked his choice to use a ghostwriter since a lot of times a professional journalist can really bring out the complexities of a story in an engaging way that keeps the reader hooked. I never blame celebrities for hiring someone to help them write their book. At the end of the day, it makes for a better product and a writer gets paid, so it's a win-win. But that's just to say that there isn't a lot of writing stuff itself to examine here. When I reviewed Jeanette McCurdy's book, I'm Glad My Mom Died last summer, I really focused a lot on the writing, and that's because Jeanette herself clearly wrote the entire book as part of a passion project that she'd always wanted to be a professional writer, as she talks about in the book, and this was her debut book. And I thought the writing in that book, in addition to the subject matter, was what really blew me away. That's all to say that I'm not going to be dissecting the writing much in this book, because the writing was pretty straightforward, and this book's impact comes a lot more from its content rather than the execution of that content. So what is the content that this book reveals? The book opens with a scene of Jill and her soon-to-be husband Derek, they're about 23 years old at the time, and they're going sledding with the whole Duggar family. While they're sledding, Jill hears her parents call out, hey, no boys and girls sharing a sled! Jill looks around, wondering which of her brothers and sisters were trying to share a sled, before she realizes that her parents were actually talking to her and Derek, even though they're about to be married they're still not allowed to sit together on a sled because they're different genders. No sharing a sled until marriage, God does not allow that. This leads into a discussion of the very restrictive rules that the Duggar family had for gender segregation. Dating rituals within this family were called courtship, and part of courtship included things like the parents having to chaperone every date, no holding hands on your dates, at least until you're like engaged or something, no physical intimacy, including kissing until marriage. Your first kiss should be right after the pastor says, I now pronounce you husband and wife, then you can kiss, and then you can start having sex like an hour later so that you can start birthing babies. It's like zero to a hundred in this family. We also get an overview of the other Duggar family rules. This includes no music with drums. The only music allowed was like church hymns, like with vocals or a piano or an organ, but no drums. Even Christian rock music was banned because it has percussion. And why is that a problem? Because drums have a nice beat and a nice beat makes you want to dance. And if you dance, you might shake your butt. And if you shake your butt, then you could draw attention to it, which could cause someone else to have impure thoughts. So from the very beginning, these kids were all basically told anything you could do could cause someone else to abuse you. You just lived in constant fear that something bad could happen to you and it would be your own fault. How disgusting is that? There's a common theme here of the family constantly making women responsible for men having impure thoughts. You're the cause of all my their problems. The girls weren't allowed to wear pants because pants frame your butt, and if a man sees your booty shape, he might have impure thoughts. They couldn't wear makeup because makeup emphasizes your facial features, and then men might have impure thoughts. No showing your shoulders because that's too much skin, and men might have impure thoughts. On and on and on. The kids in the family wore Nike sneakers, so whenever they were out in public and saw a woman dressed provocatively, meaning like wearing a crop top or tight jeans, or God forbid a bathing suit on the beach, the parents would yell out Nike and make all the boys look down at their shoes so that they wouldn't have to see these promiscuous women trying to tempt them into impure thoughts. At one point, the Duggar family tries going to a local Baptist church that allows the women to wear form-fitting blazers, and sometimes they even get up in the pews and dance to the music. And Jim Bob is just so horrified by this that not only does his family never go back to the church again, but he also sits the boys down after church and apologizes to them for having to see such explicit imagery. They then change churches. The book also talks about about how despite the Duggar family 
family spending so much of their lives being on reality TV, they never actually watched TV and they weren't allowed to have a TV in the house. The reason being the IBLP discouraged people from letting their members watch any secular programming and they were supposed to only consume IBLP approved media. But remember, it's totally not a cult. Anyway, Jim Bob was okay with allowing the family to be featured on TV despite not owning a TV because he believed that God had called him to share the gospel and that it was his mission to use his family to reach as many secular families as possible and convert them. We're on a mission from God. Now, while this book does show a lot of horrifying stuff, it's not all bad. Remember, this is Jill's memoir, so she's going to detail the good times in her childhood as well as the bad. She talks about how, due to there being so many children in the family, the kids would all form little clubs where they do things like eat ice cream together. She talks about Josh making a homemade pickle recipe that everyone really enjoyed. She recounts some of the family trips that they took, like going to the beach together, visiting local amusement parks for the day. And most of these moments she recalls fondly, enjoying the ways that she could bond with her siblings, and in those moments, how she she felt truly loved by her parents. And I think this is important. In showing a situation of indoctrination and abuse like this, it's good for the writer to show both the good and the bad times. If all we see is the bad, it's harder for us as the reader to identify these patterns when we see things like this in our own lives. We're all susceptible to being recruited into cults. We're all susceptible to abusive relationships. And when the depictions that we see in books, TV, and general media are just a recollection of the worst, most shocking times, we can easily write off our own situations as, well, mine isn't that bad. We have so many good times. This person or this organization is really nice and lifts me up sometimes. And it's those good times that make us justify to ourselves why we shouldn't leave. I mean, along with other systemic issues like financial instability, monetary abuse, things like that. But what I'm saying here is it's good that Jill showed how much fun she used to have with her family. It gives us a complete picture of how conflicted she felt in speaking out against them and the reasons that she felt so emotionally attached to them in the first place. However, this book definitely shows Jim Bob as having something of a God complex himself. Like Bill Gothard, Jim Bob Duggar has a lot of ways that he thinks God is communicating with him directly and calling him specifically to share the gospel in any way he can. We first see this when he decides to run for Arkansas Senate before any of the TLC shows about the family came out. When he wasn't sure if he was going to run or not, he flipped a coin three times and since all three flips came up heads, he figured that was God telling him that he was called to run for Senate. And so he did. The entire family walked to the polls to Together to go vote and to support Jim Bob. I mean, the kids weren't old enough to vote, but the point was it showed the family in solidarity. The press got a hold of this photo of this entire family supporting their dad, and this network called Discovery saw it and thought, hey, this is really cute. After all, look how big this family is, and they're all such a cohesive unit, and they're all showing support for each other. This could be a really heartwarming story for TV. That combined with the fact that Michelle was also pregnant with the 15th Duggar child made for Discovery's 2004 documentary called 14 children and pregnant again. Jim Bob ended up losing the race for Senate, but what he won was even better. After the Discovery documentary aired, the documentary was so loved that TLC, one of Discovery's networks, decided to turn the show into an entire reality series, which, as we know, became 17 Kids and Counting, then 18 Kids and Counting, then 19 Kids and Counting. Around this time was also when Jim Bob and Michelle first learned of Josh's misconduct. After the parents learned that Josh had been touching his younger sisters, they said, sent him away to a troubled teen program. Instead of getting him real therapy or educating him on the importance of consent, because this family was in a cult, they sent him to a program run by the IBLP instead, which did little to actually change Josh as a person and really just had him working manual labor and doing construction. But apparently this cured him, at least from Jim Bob and Michelle's perspectives. The book then starts to get into Bill Gothard and the IBLP's influence. Jill talks about having met Bill Gothard a few times and how she knew that even though the IBLP was always going on, on and on about the importance of having as many kids as you could and no sex until marriage, etc., that Bill Gothard himself was not married and also didn't have any children. However, Jill as a child never thought it was weird. She just didn't really give it a second thought because everyone took it as a given that the rules didn't apply to Bill Gothard since he was the leader because it's totally not a cult. Jill then breaks down the IBLP's umbrellas of influence with the emphasis on how kids are always underneath their parents even after they're married. This becomes a point of contention later because 
even after Jill becomes a full adult, even after she's in her mid-twenties, married with children, Jim Bob is still trying to control her and punish her and still believes that he has moral authority over her as a person. This is around when we start to get into Jill and Derek's wedding. Jill explains that while they do the whole dad walks the daughter down the aisle and gives her away thing, that there is no actual giving away happening, that Jim Bob is upfront with her how the ritual is just an act for the wedding because she will never be given away, she is never to be out from under his influence. Because that's not what the IBLP wants. Now, I've always personally found this ritual of giving someone away to be a little weird, and that's not any criticism towards anyone who did that at their own wedding, just how the Duggars treat it as a wedding ritual done for the fun and tradition. I think that's what a lot of people do now. Sure, sometimes a dad still walks a bride down the aisle, but most people don't actually consider the father to have owned his daughter up until that point. I mean, and some communities probably do, but not everyone who does this ritual actually means that literally. Literally. You mean figuratively. But the Duggars did it symbolically in the opposite way. While a lot of people would just be like, yeah, I know my dad didn't own me before I was married, but he's walking me down the aisle because it's a fun part of the wedding process. The Duggars were like, we're also doing it just because it's a fun part of the wedding process. And we agree that it's not literal, but in our case, it's not literal in the opposite direction because yes, the dad does own the daughter before marriage, but he continues to own her after marriage too. Literally. And not only did Jim Bob get to dictate how the wedding went, so did TLC. Jill's wedding was one of TLC's most anticipated events. The wedding episode brought in millions of viewers. Because of that, Jill and Derek weren't allowed to have any of their friends take photos or share photos, which was something that they'd wanted them to do. TLC got the first rights to all the photos that were going to air. Right before the wedding happens, this is where we get into one of the biggest conflicts in the book, which is Jim Bob tricking his kids into signing contracts and then siphoning money from them. Jim Bob is a scammer, y'all. That's, that's kind of the theme of this book. So the night before Jill and Derek's wedding, everything is just pure chaos. Derek's mom has been battling cancer for a long time and she has a few brushes with almost dying and they finally learn that she is going to be able to attend the wedding with some hospital supervision. While this is happening, Jill is trying to get ready for the wedding in a room with a bunch of her sisters and in the midst of all the chaos, Jim Bob bursts in and is like, hey kids, I have a contract for you to sign. He gives Jill a one page contract, just the page for her signature. He removes all the other pages that are on top of it and never even acknowledges that they exist or that they're missing. So she doesn't get the whole contract to read and he tells her this contract is just going over how you're gonna get paid for the show. And Jill still trusts her dad up until this point. She says, okay. She signs it and then gets back to the wedding. Jim Bob will then refuse to show her the other 30 pages of this contract for the next four years, so stay tuned for all that drama. But what's important here is that Jill, even without the rest of the contract available, doesn't think twice about signing, partially because Jim Bob chose the moment where everyone was focused on other very important things, and partially because she'd been raised to trust her father completely. The IBLP teachings say you should never question your parents, ever, in your entire life, even in your adulthood, so following this lead seemed natural to her. After the wedding, after the wedding, Jill finds out that she's pregnant and she wants to tell her family and friends, but TLC producers stop her. They tell her that everyone she's already told has to keep quiet about it and that she has to recreate the scene of telling them for the camera and that they have exclusive rights to the story. At last, the boy's soul is mine. Jill's starting to get kind of annoyed at this point. She's like, okay, you didn't let anyone take photos at my wedding. Now you're not letting me tell my family and friends about my pregnancy because you somehow own the rights to my pregnancy. That's really weird. This isn't just a story, this is my life. And her husband is starting to grow really skeptical of TLC at this point. When it's time for Jill to give birth to her first child, she's pretty clear that she does not want a camera crew watching. She wants to give birth on her own, but everyone pressures her into it, talking about how much money it's gonna make for the show. And then they offer her a compromise. The compromise is that she can give birth in a hospital instead of at home in the bed like Michelle always does or on the toilet like Josh's wife Anna had just recently done. Eventually, Jill gives into the pressure and lets the cameras into the hospital to film her giving birth. At this point, Derek is getting pretty annoyed with TLC, inserting themselves into every part of their lives. And he's like, hey, Jill, can't you just leave the show and say, no, this isn't working for me? But Jill is still really scared to disobey Jim Bob because according to what she's been taught for her entire life, it is sinful for her to go against her father's authority. And then after that, Josh Duggar gets publicly exposed twice. First, when the website Ashley Madison has that huge data breach. For those who don't know, Ashley Madison was a dating site specifically for married people who wanted to have secret affairs. And then one day, all the users got leaked and everyone found out about all these famous people cheating on their spouses. And who was among them but Josh Duggar? And then after that is when the real bombshell hits. The magazine In Touch decides to release the entire investigation that had gone on more than a decade before. The investigation that reveals what Josh had done to his younger sisters. This information had not been published public at 
all up to this point, and Jill had been living her life hoping that no one ever found out about her childhood trauma. At this point, Jill is extremely upset with In Touch that they decided to print this. They just printed all this graphic information about what happened, and now she's forced to relive it. And this is just re-traumatizing her all over again. But of course, what is Jim Bob most concerned about? His daughter's mental health, his son being held accountable for his actions, or at the very least getting some kind of legitimate therapy? No, of course not. He doesn't give a shit about any of that. His first thought is his TV show and how this is going to affect the profit that his family is making. Oh, sorry, I actually mean how many people in the secular homes it's gonna reach to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ and convert them through television. So Jim Bob encourages Jill and Jessa, who were two of Josh's victims, to do an interview on Megyn Kelly's show about what happened. And if you watch the interview, it's very clear that Jim Bob had coached Jill and Jessa ahead of time. As the book details, the interview was for the sake of the press. It wasn't an avenue for Jill to actually get to tell her own story. It was meant to save the show's reputation. Hence why, if you go back and rewatch the interview, it's obvious how hard she's trying to protect Josh. And you are going on the record as being two of Josh's victims. Mm -hmm. Does it feel strange to use that word? You know... I think we didn't choose to come out and tell our story. This wouldn't have been our first choice, but now that this story has been brought about, we really feel like as we've been seeing these headlines, as we've been seeing things that people are saying about our family, we feel like as the victims, we have to come out and speak. This is something like we chose to do. Nobody asked us to do this. Jess and I were talking, we're like, Oh my goodness, the most of the stuff out there is lies. It's not true. He was a boy, young boy in puberty, and a little too curious about girls. And in our case, you know, it's very mild compared to what happens to some I know young so many women. girls and go through things that are way worse. So for me, even when my parents came and sat down and told me this, I was like, really? Like, you know, I'm sad, I'm shocked. At the same time, like Jessa was saying, I was shocked, you know, I'm like, okay, like, and I'm sad because this is my older brother who I love a lot, and so it's like, you know, they're, con they're conflicting there. And this is where the biggest revelation in the book happens. Not only was that interview something that Jill was pressured into doing for the sake of saving the show, but also Josh was in the room. While they were filming the interview, Josh was on a couch off to the side. Jill could see him the entire time she was talking to Megyn Kelly about the abuse that he caused. Why would anyone allow that? After this, Jill starts to get frustrated, and it's one of the first signs that she's starting to question Jim Bob's influence. She talks about how frustrating it is that her father went to all this trouble to keep Josh's privacy and protect his reputation, but that required her having to forfeit her own privacy and having to have her SA story told publicly and recounted throughout the media. In the book, Jill says, I couldn't help but think about the lengths that Pop had gone in order to guard Josh's privacy and keep him from being publicly humiliated. The feelings grew stronger within me and I felt sick to my core. When the In Touch story broke, all I had wanted was to be protected. All I'd wanted was to have privacy and space to grieve without feeling the weight upon myself to fix the situation. What I'd really wanted was for Pops to say, no, we're not going to put you on Fox News. I'm going to do everything I can to keep you girls out of this. We are not concerned for the future of our show. I, as a woman, was expected to do all I could to protect Pops and Josh. So Jim Bob's doing everything he can to keep the show running and he will not let it end. He keeps the family invested by talking about how TLC is a secular network and they're getting the chance to spread the gospel and it's a mission from God and that if they quit doing the show, they're disobeying God. But Jill and Derek are like, okay, well, we're not actually obligated to do this, so we might not. And then Jim Bob's like, actually, yes, you are obligated. Remember the contract you signed the night before your wedding? This is where Jill learns that the contract entitled TLC to five more years of her on the show, including rights to film her births and everything until the year 2018. Forever. When Jill and Derek finally ask to read the full contract, Jim Bob just refuses to show it to them. Then one day, hoping to just get out of all this controversy, Jim Bob finally agrees to pay the older kids for their work on the show for the first time ever, which is what he should have been doing all along. As the book explains, at this point, Jim Bob had been acquiring more cars, getting his own airplanes, donating to political candidates, taking the family on vacations, etc. But none of the kids on the show had seen a dollar of the profits for their work. So Jim Bob tells the kids that they each get $80,000 as payment for the work that they did if they will sign one other paper. Well, most of the kids are okay with this, but Jill does not trust Jim Bob at this point. So she has Derek, who has some experience with 
contracts and accounting, read over them, and he points out that this new contract would guarantee them further rights to use them and their kids in the show, plus would require them to sign a lifetime non-disclosure agreement. Thank goodness she didn't sign it because now she gets to disclose. This kind of reminded me of when we reviewed I'm Glad My Mom Died, where Jeanette McCurdy talks about how Nickelodeon offered her hush money not to talk about Dan Schneider, and she refused to take it, and then she put out the bombshell memoir. Jill is similar here. She doesn't sign the NDA, and now she gets to tell us what really happened. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Later, Jill and Derek learn that Jim Bob has been reporting the kids' income to the IRS for the show, despite the fact that Jill hasn't made anything, and the other kids maybe made $80,000 if they signed his new contract, but Jill's income had been reported to the IRS by Jim Bob as over $130,000. So she asked him, where did that number come from? What are you talking about? And Jim Bob Duggar, like the kind and loving dad that he is, sends Jill an itemized receipt for all the expenses he had to pay in the past few years of being her dad. Like, not even show expenses, expenses that he as a parent chose to pay for his daughter. Like, helping her with her car insurance or paying for things when she was young. What a loving dad who maybe did like a little tax fraud. I don't know, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not accusing him of anything. That just seems shady as fuck. But this is where we get a reference to the title of the book, Counting the Cost. I really like this title because it has kind of a triple meaning, which I think is really cool. Now, I don't know much about the Bible, but from what I looked up and what I was able to find, it seems that counting the cost Cost comes from Luke 14, 25 to 33, a passage where Jesus talks about figuring out the opportunity cost of an action before you take it, or understanding the risks of something before you commit. So that title's actually perfect here. She's talking about how in a literal sense, Jim Bob had counted the cost of raising her, how he itemized a receipt and written her off as a tax expense as property and denying her payment based on what she owed him for the privilege of getting to exist. But the Bible verse also gives us another meaning about how Jill wasn't made aware of the terms of her contract before she signed. She didn't have the opportunity to count the cost herself in that way. And finally, using counting as the first word of the title draws a reference to the show 19 Kids and Counting, or later Jill's show called Counting On. So very good work on the title, whoever decided the title, A plus on that. Jill is now losing trust in her father, and she's also starting to lose faith in the IBLP. Seeing her father deceive her in a way that she was told would never happen is shattering her into entire worldview. On top of that, Bill Gothard's now getting accused of misconduct by a bunch of women, and now Jill is losing faith in the entire organization as well. We then see Jill about to give birth to her second child. For the birth, she has been adamant that there will be no film crew in the hospital. She has an approved list of people who are allowed to be there, which includes her husband and her mom. Jim Bob is not on that list. While she's giving birth, she has a ton of complications that without emergency hospital services honestly could have taken her life. She experiences a uterine rupture. She needs to be given an emergency C-section immediately before she can even get anesthesia. It's a lot. And then this happens. But even when life was as fragile as it was in those days, the show still had a way of casting its cold, dark shadow over us. Derek Derek stepped out from the NICU one afternoon to see Pops there talking with some of the staff. Derek was confused, as with hospital protocol only allowing a limited number of slots on our unsupervised visitor list, we'd not given Pops permission to visit. Thanks to the show, however, everyone knew who Pops was. When he'd come for a visit, he'd been invited inside without hesitation. A lot of people were asking about him, said Pops, holding his phone so Derek could glance at it. There was a text message that had just come from Chad, who was still working with Pops. Get me a picture of that baby. So Chad is the PR guy for the show. After this, Jill starts to go through a series of very complicated, conflicting emotions. She's starting to think that maybe she might not be able to have any more kids, both due to physical complications and due to fear of what her body might go through again. So she starts taking birth control at the recommendation of her doctor, and she feels weird about this because her entire life she'd been told birth control is wrong. If God wants you to have a baby, you have that baby. But she's thinking, hey, maybe God's actually telling me that I shouldn't be having more kids right now if this is what my body's having to go through. At the same time, she feels a little sad because she'd always envisioned herself having a ton of children. So she's sadly telling this story to a friend while she's hanging out around her family. I don't know whether I'm going to be able to have any more kids. My friend reached out to put an arm around me, but before she could say anything, Pops's voice filled the corridor. We don't know for sure, do we? 
I turned. He was looking right at me, smiling. He meant well, I guess, but in that moment, I was mad. I wanted to ask him why he thought he had the right to comment about my uterus, but I bit the words back. In this moment, Jill is just completely fed up with Jim Bob. During her last birth, in which she had life-threatening complications, Jim Bob disregarded her wishes, barged into her hospital room against her will, and demanded a photo of the baby for his PR guy. After that, once she's trying to deal with the emotional pain of the knowledge that she might not be able to have any more kids, Jim Bob's right there to put pressure on her to have more. At this point, she's getting pretty done with his influence on her life. So Jill and Derek quit the show for good. They end up joining a new church, and in this church, there are women wearing pants. Jill's about 26 years old at this point, and she's never worn pants before. She also sees women with piercings, including nose rings, and she's conflicted. All her life, she's been taught these things are wrong and sinful, that they're prideful in your appearance, that the pants are going to cause men to have impure thoughts. But now she's meeting all these new people in her church who are nice, reasonable people, and she thinks it's kind of ridiculous that something as simple as choosing her own clothes and jewelry could be sinful in any way. So she decides to try wearing some leggings, and she thinks they're comfortable, so she wears leggings out to an amusement park when she takes Derek and the kids out for the day. And of course, just by a stroke of bad luck, Jill's entire family is there too. Jim, Bob, and Michelle, and all the younger kids just happen to come to the amusement park on the same day. So she tries to avoid them, she pulls her coat down as far as it'll go to cover up her leggings, she tries to cover herself up with blankets, all of that, but her parents still see her and they still notice that she's wearing pants. Jim Bob gets very upset at her, not just for wearing pants, because her sister Ginger had started wearing pants as well, but because Jill did it without his permission. He was like, at least Ginger called me to warn me ahead of time. So these people are in their mid-twenties, they're adults with spouses and children of their own, and they're still expected to call their parents and clear their clothing choices with them ahead of time. Jill decides that she wants to get a nose ring because she thinks it looks pretty, so she gets one, but because she was told she has to clear everything with her dad first, she calls him and leaves him a voicemail ahead of time telling him she's gonna do it so he won't be surprised. But Jim Bob is not satisfied with that. A nose piercing is just too far. After she gets out of the piercing shop, she has a message waiting from her dad. The voicemail that was waiting for me from Pops when I got out, he pleaded with me not to do it. He told me I was making a huge mistake. He begged me to think about how it was going to affect my little sisters. He said I was ruining my life. Days after I'd had my nose pierced, he asked me to have a call with him and mom. I told him no and put my feelings down in a text. Honestly, I don't really feel like talking when there might be a chance I'm just going to be verbally abused, manipulated, and emotionally hurt. Jim Bob loses it at this text. They go to family mediation, and here is the scene from family mediation. We were sitting in a horseshoe formation, the moderator in the middle, with the Dillards and Duggards facing each other from opposite couches, open space between us. Pops took a step toward me, closing the gap. It wasn't a gesture of reconciliation, it was an act of aggression. He towered over me, his body fueled with anger, my eyes filled with tears. You know why you're crying, don't you? Your conscience is talking to you. Pops' voice was so loud in my ears. You're guilty! Pops was yelling, stabbing a finger at me. You want to know why I'm crying? My voice was cracked, my eyes burning. It's that you think I'm some kind of horrible person just because I wear pants and have a nose ring. You treat me like I'm a prodigal who turned her back on you. You treat me worse than you treat my P-word brother. Jim Bob does not respond to this. He has no response to this. And the mediator is like, whoa, this is above my pay grade. Y'all need real therapy. Jill does start going to real therapy and it helps a lot. Jim Bob doesn't do shit. Later, Jill and Derek decide that they want to send their kids to public school, which is kind of a big deal. Public school was always villainized by the IBLP, but Jill thinks her kids are going to do actually really well in a real school environment instead of being homeschooled. So on the day that her older son has his first day of kindergarten, she and Derek sit down for drinks together. She has a pina colada and he has a beer and they take a photo of it. This is a big deal because in the IBLP you're not allowed to drink any alcohol. Jill ended up having her first glass of wine when she was like 25 or 26 or so and she didn't really like the flavor of it, but she also talks about how she's never been drunk and she never intends to be drunk or to drink to excess, but she doesn't see the issue with having a glass of wine to celebrate something or just a tasty cocktail once in a while and I agree what's the issue but Jim Bob does not see it the same way he sees the photo of Derek having a beer and he literally offers to send Derek to the same rehab program that he'd sent Josh to you know the one he sent Josh to for doing non-consensual things to girls you treat me worse than you treat my P-word brother. He wanted to send Derek to that rehab program too because he also clearly needs rehab since he's an alcoholic 
since he had one beer. Derek very obviously declines this offer. After this, we learn that Josh has finally gotten caught possessing CP, he goes to trial, he gets found guilty, and he's now serving 12 years in prison. The TLC empire reigning over the Duggars' lives has now ended for good. The rest of the book details Jill's struggle to have a relationship with the rest of her family. She still wants to be in contact with them, and she has a lot of good memories to look back on, but she's also still working through a lot of pain. She talks about how she allows these feelings to coexist, enjoying the positive memories, but also acknowledging the pain that her family has caused and she talks about how much she's been working through it in therapy. I thought this was a really nice ending, and I was really glad to hear how well Jill's doing in therapy. I know a lot of people probably wanted to see her go no contact with her parents and cut them off for good, but that's often much easier said than done, and we have to remember that this is her own process to work through and to figure out what's going to be best for her. Like the documentary Shiny Happy People, this book was no stranger to controversy. When Jill announced the release of this book on Instagram, Duggar fans flooded the comments with posts about how she should feel guilty for talking talking bad about her family. Here is a sampling of the comments from when Jill posted her book announcement. I feel so bad for the younger siblings still living at home knowing the older ones have turned on the family. Yeah, sure, you didn't like the rules, but you definitely liked all the perks of traveling all over the world and getting paid by the show. Why not wait till the younger siblings are out of the house so they don't have to deal with all the trouble that these books will bring? It's not just you, Jill, that wrote the books after leaving, so my comments are for all you older Duggars. Why not think of the younger ones? I mean, it sounds like she is thinking of the younger ones because uh, maybe she could help prevent them from having to go through everything she did. This comment says, No one is perfect, but as far as I'm concerned, you have very godly parents. The world is cheering you on because they hate God and godly families and they love to look upon the flaws of believers to justify themselves. Why not just quietly work this out with your parents? like she didn't try, as we saw in the book. I had unbelieving parents who put me through a lot. I won't name it out of respect. There are things no one else needs to know, just out of respect. My dad, because a believer before he passed, and I pray for my mother's salvation. There are things that my children will never hear about them because of respect for God and my parents. Someone comments and is like, and this is why it continues. Speak up and speak loud and speak your truth. That is what heals and that will stop the generational trauma that continues. And someone else is like, godly parents, they protected a I'm not gonna say it out loud, but you know what Josh is. <laughs> so this person said, be prepared for your own children to write a book about your failures. I have mixed feelings on this. The enemy loves to destroy families. And someone was like, that's solid advice. Think of the book your children might write 20 years down the road, then raise them with that thought in mind. If you do the right thing, you'll have nothing to be ashamed of. I agree, what great advice. What a great way to turn that around. This person says this is what the woke agenda is all about. Hating on families and cheering someone on who airs their dirty laundry for the world to see. What a shame. Someone else said, I can't help but feel bad for your parents. I cannot imagine my children writing tell-all books about family. Here's the thing, Jill. No family is perfect, not one. And yes, while most do not have reality TV shows, you would also not have the opportunity to profit from your story. And someone's like, there's a big difference between being imperfect and what happened to Jill. And someone says her parents profited off of her, why shouldn't she do the same? And that's the thing too, they profited off of her! Jim Bob grew rich off of this show. He launched his failed political career. <laughs> but, but Jill did not ask to be on the show. She was put on the show when she was a minor and she didn't even get to profit from it the same way that they did. It's insane. And this in general is just all wild to me. Now, I'm not a conservative Christian myself, but if I were, I would think the logical choice would be to support Jill's book. All the time. Whenever any religious group has extreme members that do things to harm other people in the name of religion, the more reasonable members of that particular religion will usually say things like, well, that's an extreme example. Most of us aren't like this. Most of us want to use religion for good, not evil. Those people are exploiting it. So why doesn't that apply here? Keep in mind, Jill is still a Christian. She includes Bible references all throughout the book. She and Derek go to church. She's still following the majority of things in line with more traditional Christian culture in America. She's a wife and a mother. She doesn't spread radical leftist ideology or talk about socialism. She's not an atheist and she's never once criticized Christianity as a whole. If anything, Jill is the perfect example of a model Christian right now. And she still believes in God. That's deconstruction. That's what it looks like. It does not always have to end in atheism. Someone who went through horrific abuse because of an extremist cult within the church, but she came out of it still believing in God and still wanting to be part of other Christian communities. If Christian communities want to portray their religion positively, shouldn't they be supporting this book? Since Jill is a good example of a devoted Christian, literally all Jill did was leave a family that condoned abuse. She specifically says in the book that God is still an important part of her life, but that she doesn't support this false vision of God that condones 
abuse and exploitation. So if people are mad at her for telling her story, for going against the rest of her family, does that mean they prefer the abuse and exploitation? This makes absolutely no sense. I think the dedication page of this book actually sums it up really well. Right here at the beginning of the book, Jill says, to those who have been harmed in the name of religion, to those who have suffered behind closed doors and have yet to find their voice, to those who have begun to find their voice but may still be living in a season of isolation, to those who, like Esther of the Old Testament Bible story, have courageously answered the call for such a time as this, Esther 414, and despite the backlash, have now found their voice. From victims and survivors to strangers, family, and friends, this book is dedicated to you. May you all know that you are not alone, that your story, your voice, and your mental health matter. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in the times of trouble. Psalm 99. That right there shows how devoted Jill still is to her faith. She just isn't willing to excuse abuse in the name of it. I think this is a perfect book for Christians to support if they want to promote a healthy, positive religious community rather than a cult. Another piece of this book's reception I want to discuss is how it handled Josh's assault of Jill. Jill talks a lot about how she hated that her story became a public piece of news and entertainment. She hated how they aired her trauma for the public to read. And I think a lot of people went into this book expecting to learn more about how awful Josh is and more details on what Josh did to her, and I'm really glad that the book didn't go into that. Jill is extremely clear that she does not want to relive that trauma anymore, especially publicly. Her entire point is that trauma shouldn't have to be entertainment for the public, and so she's not going to let it be. I love how she details multiple times who exactly she wants us to blame regarding her SA story being made public. Every time in the book she references the story at all, she repeats the following line. I hold in touch Bauer, Kathy O'Kelly, Ernest Kate, the City of Springdale, the Washington County Sheriff's Office, and Rick Hoyt responsible for releasing and publishing the report. Every time it's brought up, she names that entire list. It's great. Jill's process of deconstructing and healing. Now, I do have to say that I don't agree with Jill Duggar on everything she does or everything she believes. Fundy Fridays in her video about this book details how Jill's husband, Derek, still has some public anti-LGBTQ beliefs that he has spouted on Twitter, and I do not condone that whatsoever. I'd also recommend watching the Fundy Fridays video in addition to this one because she goes into more details on that. But that's to say that there are plenty of things about Jill that I disagree with. Her husband's beliefs about the LGBTQ community being one, and on top of that, a lot of the book talks about about Jill and Derek doing mission work in Central America, and I'm really not a fan of mission trips or missionary work in general. In addition, I saw that Jill and Derek briefly had a family vlog, which I also don't support because I think family vlogs are awful. But it also looks like she hasn't uploaded any videos, including her kids, in over a year, and that her last video, which was eight months ago, was just about her dog, which is great, I love dog videos. I have to wonder if maybe Jill just assumed publicizing your kids was so normal since it was how she grew up, and then recently decided to leave that behind as well along with the show. Almost all of these videos come from before Josh's trial, from before the Duggar family's reality TV life was completely over. So I'll give her credit for learning her lesson and not doing it anymore. And that's all to say that things like deconstructing from a cult and healing from trauma are slow, lifelong processes. And while I do think that Jill's husband absolutely deserves criticism for the very nasty things he said on Twitter, and while I think it's valid to continue criticizing elements of missionary work as an industry, I also do think it's important to read this book and hear out Jill's story. The the reason for that is that while Jill isn't a perfect human being, by nature of being human, all of us deserve to be the ones in charge of telling our own stories. For so long, Jill was put on reality TV with her parents, the IBLP cult, and a giant camera crew from TLC controlling her story for her. This book is a step in the direction of regaining control of her own perception, and I think that's an important right for everyone to have. I especially recommend this book to people who are really invested in Christian communities. Jill regularly weaves in examples of her faith while she speaks out against the IBLP. She shows how Christians are capable of staying true to their beliefs without having to give in to extremist cults. A lot of so-called Christians who are berating her on Instagram for this book really seem to be saying the quiet part out loud. I think it's important that we see how far Jill has come from being basically born into a cult and then having more than a decade of her life broadcast on TV without her consent she didn't get to observe the world in the same way that a lot of others did. But now she's opening her mind, she's expanding her worldview, and that's an important quality to encourage. Plus, it takes a lot of courage to speak out against your own family, especially a family as close as the Duggars were. In conclusion, it should be illegal for kids to be on reality TV, full stop. We just need laws against minors being on reality TV. I don't think there is an ethical way to do it at this point. And even in Jill's case, she was already an adult in her early 20s when Jim Bob tricked her into signing a contract 
contract that she didn't want under false pretenses. I think if you're going to be on reality TV, there need to be more safeguards in place, like ensuring that a lawyer is present at the signing of every contract, and not just a lawyer for the whole family, like one for each individual. And that we can't allow minors to have their lives broadcast this way. It's completely unethical. And it leaves way too much room for parents to excuse the abuse and exploitation of their own children for profit. I am really glad that Jill spoke up about her story, and I hope this book helps empower others in a similar situation to do the same. I absolutely recommend reading Counting the Cost. If any of you guys have read it, I'm curious to know your thoughts on the book as well. Please let me know them in the comments below. Otherwise, I will see you again next week for more videos. And in the meantime, don't forget to keep on supporting small businesses and not supporting cults. Bye! Get you some nuts! Yeah, you effin'. Up yours, woke moralist. We'll see who cancels who.